Chapter Eleven of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Eleven. The Ring at Casterbridge was merely the local name of one of the finest Roman amphitheatres, if not the very finest, remaining in Britain. Casterbridge announced Old Rome in every street, alley, and precinct. It looked Roman, bespoke the art of Rome, concealed dead men of Rome. It was impossible to dig more than a foot or two deep about the town fields and gardens without coming upon some tall soldier or other of the empire who had lain there in his silent unobtrusive rest for a space of fifteen hundred years. He was mostly found lying on his side in an oval scoop in the chalk like a chicken in its shell, his knees drawn up to his chest sometimes with the remains of his spear against his arm a fibula or brooch of bronze on his breast or forehead an urn at his knees a jar at his throat a bottle at his mouth and mystified conjecture pouring down upon him from the eyes of casterbridge street boys and men who had turned a moment to gaze at the familiar spectacle as they passed by imaginative inhabitants who would have felt an unpleasantness at the discovery of a comparatively modern skeleton in their gardens were quite unmoved by these hoary shapes they had lived so long ago their time was so unlike the present their hopes and motives were so widely removed from ours that between them and the living there seemed to stretch a gulf too wide for even a spirit to pass the amphitheatre was a huge circular enclosure with a notch at opposite extremities of its diameter north and south from its sloping internal form it might have been called the spittoon of the jotuns it was to casterbridge what the ruined Colosseum is to modern rome and was nearly of the same magnitude the dusk of evening was the proper hour at which a true impression of this suggestive place could be received standing in the middle of the arena at that time there by degrees became apparent its real vastness which a cursory view from the summit at noonday was apt to obscure melancholy impressive lonely yet accessible from every part of the town the historic circle was the frequent spot for appointments of a furtive kind intrigues were arranged there tentative meetings were there experimented after divisions and feuds but one kind of appointment, in itself the most common of any, seldom had place in the amphitheatre, that of happy lovers. Why, seeing that it was preeminently an airy, accessible, and sequestered spot for interviews, the cheerfullest form of those occurrences never took kindly to the soil of the ruin, would be a curious inquiry. Perhaps it was because its associations had about them something sinister its history proved that apart from the sanguinary nature of the games originally played therein such incidents attached to its past as these that for scores of years the town gallows had stood at one corner that in seventeen o five a woman who had murdered her husband was half strangled and then burnt there in the presence of ten thousand spectators tradition reports that at a certain stage of the burning her heart burst and leapt out of her body to the terror of them all and that not one of those ten thousand people ever cared particularly for hot roast after that in addition to these old tragedies pugilistic encounters almost to the death had come off down to recent dates in that secluded arena entirely invisible to the outside world save by climbing to the top of the enclosure which few townspeople in the daily round of their lives ever took the trouble to do so that though close to the turnpike road crimes might be perpetrated there unseen at midday some boys had latterly tried to impart gaiety to the ruin by using the central arena as a cricket ground but the game usually languished for the aforesaid reason the dismal privacy which the earthen circle enforced shutting out every appreciative passer's vision every commendatory remark from outsiders everything except the sky and to play at games in such circumstances was like acting to an empty house possibly too the boys were timid for some old people said that at certain moments in the summer-time in broad daylight 
persons sitting with a book or dozing in the arena had on lifting their eyes beheld the slopes lined with a gazing legion of hadrian's soldiery as if watching the gladiatorial combat and had heard the roar of their excited voices that the scene would remain but a moment like a lightning flash and then disappear it was related that there still remained under the south entrance excavated cells for the reception of the wild animals and athletes who took part in the games the arena was still smooth and circular as if used for its original purpose not so very long ago the sloping pathways by which spectators had ascended to their seats were pathways yet but the whole was grown over with grass which now at the end of summer was bearded with withered bents that formed waves under the brush of the wind returning to the attentive ear aeolian modulations and detaining for moments the flying globes of thistledown henchard had chosen this spot as being the safest from observation which he could think of for meeting his long-lost wife and at the same time as one easily to be found by a stranger after nightfall as mayor of the town with a reputation to keep up he could not invite her to come to his house till some definite course had been decided on just before eight he approached the deserted earthwork and entered by the south path which descended over the debris of the former dens in a few moments he could discern a female figure creeping in by the great north gap or public gateway they met in the middle of the arena neither spoke just at first there was no necessity for speech and the poor woman leant against henchard who supported her in his arms i don't drink he said in a low halting apologetic voice you hear susan i don't drink now i haven't since that night those were his first words he felt her bow her head in acknowledgment that she understood after a minute or two he again began if i had known you were living susan but there was every reason to suppose you and the child were dead and gone i took every possible step to find you travelled advertised my opinion at last was that you had started for some colony with that man and had been drowned on your voyage why did you keep silent like this oh michael because of him what other reason could there be i thought i owed him faithfulness to the end of one of our lives foolishly i believed there was something solemn and binding in the bargain i thought that even in honor i dared not desert him when he had paid so much for me in good faith i meet you now only as his widow i consider myself that and that i have no claim upon you had he not died i should never have come never of that you may be sure how could you be so simple i don't know yet it would have been very wicked if i had not thought like that said susan almost crying yes yes so it would it is only that which makes me feel an innocent woman but to lead me into this what michael she asked alarmed why this difficulty about our living together again and elizabeth jane she cannot be told all she would so despise us both that i could not bear it that was why she was brought up in ignorance of you i could not bear it either well we must talk of a plan for keeping her in her present belief and getting matters straight in spite of it you have heard i am in a large way of business here that i am mayor of the town and churchwarden and i don't know what all yes she murmured these things as well as the dread of the girl discovering our disgrace makes it necessary to act with extreme caution so that i don't see how you two can return openly to my house as the wife and daughter i once treated badly and banished from me and there's the rubber it we'll go away at once i only came to see no no susan you are not to go you mistake me he said with kindly severity i have thought of this plan that you and elizabeth take a cottage in the town as the widow mrs newson and her daughter that i meet you court you and marry you elizabeth jane coming to my house as my stepdaughter the thing is so natural and easy that it is half done in thinking of it this would leave my shady headstrong disgraceful life as a young man absolutely unopened 
the secret would be yours and mine only and i should have the pleasure of seeing my own only child under my roof as well as my wife i am quite in your hands michael she said meekly i came here for the sake of elizabeth for myself if you tell me to leave again to-morrow morning and never come near you more i am content to go now now we don't want to hear that said henchard gently of course you won't leave again think over the plan i have proposed for a few hours and if you can't hit upon a better one we'll adopt it i have to be away for a day or two on business unfortunately but during that time you can get lodgings the only ones in the town fit for you are those over the china shop in high street and you can also look for a cottage if the lodgings are in high street they are dear i suppose never mind you must start genteel if our plan is to be carried out look to me for money have you enough till i come back quite said she and are you comfortable at the inn oh yes and the girl is quite safe from learning the shame of her case and ours that's what makes me most anxious of all you would be surprised to find how unlikely she is to dream of the truth how could she ever suppose such a thing true i like the idea of repeating our marriage said mrs henchard after a pause it seems the only right course after all this now i think i must go back to elizabeth jane and tell her that our kinsman mr henchard kindly wishes us to stay in the town very well arrange that yourself i'll go some way with you no no don't run any risk said his wife anxiously i can find my way back it is not late please let me go alone right said henchard but just one word do you forgive me susan she murmured something but seemed to find it difficult to frame her answer never mind all in good time said he judge me by my future works good-bye he retreated and stood at the upper side of the amphitheatre while his wife passed out through the lower way and descended under the trees to the town then henchard himself went homeward going so fast that by the time he reached his door he was almost upon the heels of the unconscious woman from whom he had just parted he watched her up the street and turned into his house end of chapter 11